Lord, we just thank you for um, the hungry hearts that are gathered, that we're family, and we, we, we are hungry for the bread of life. We need the bread of life, Lord, and it, it, however poured out or broken or whatever we are as vessels, Lord, it's you that is the treasure in us, and it's your spirit that lifts up and feeds and nourishes our spirits with the, the living Christ, and so our confidence is in you, Lord, that you would break that bread, pour out that wine, feed your people, Father. And we uh, love you, and we're hungry for you. That's why we're here, Lord. So we just turn our hearts to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So um, let's go to page 97. We're getting on the last few pages of the book. And I, do, I was informed that um, after I get back from Ireland, that Wednesday, um, which will be maybe the 19th of 17th, we get Monday's the 16th, or yep, the 17th, Wednesday the 17th, we should have a Like a Dove class. And I think that will be our last one. So with this class and with the next class, then we have two more classes left. And that's good because we've about four pages left. Three pages? Four pages, in which we can take a good 20 classes on four pages. <laughs> but we can also make it two classes. <laughs> and then next, um, the next topic we'll be sharing on for a semester. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it yet, so I won't say it. But <laughs> I almost let the bunny out of the box too early. <laughs> oh, the cat out of the bag. <laughs> I'm notorious for messing up <laughs> cute phrases <laughs> and making them my own weird and awkward little phrase. <laughs> that was an, a great example of that. It is now the bunny out of the box <laughs> instead of the cat out of the bag. Okay. So let's see. Top of page 97. And um, the Holy Spirit will take even the slightest thing not just anger and malice, murder, <laughs> rage, but even the slightest wrong motivation and impress in our hearts that this is not coming from Jesus, and that should not be a big surprise. <laughs> we may be surprised that the Holy Spirit noticed such a small motive, and we would not have heard his voice if we had not been carefully aware of him. He may tell us that this motive is not coming from Jesus or from a desire for Jesus, but because we want to be seen of men or something like that. If our hearts are not tender towards his care for us, we might respond towards the Holy Spirit with, oh, we did read this, didn't we? Well, what do you expect? If Christ is not yet formed within me, then that is your fault. <laughs> Ouch, run. <laughs> That is so, so sad to say that to him. You are supposed to reveal him in me, Holy Spirit. Personally, I blame you. Wow. What a strong example of grieving the Holy Spirit. I think we did read that last time, but, but let's look at it again. It's important. This person is not tender to the Holy Spirit. Really? <laughs> How could he reveal Christ in someone with a heart like that? Such a selfish and insensitive attitude would eventually pervert the knowledge of the Lord and use it for self. Amen. This person is not desirous enough to be in relationship with the Holy Spirit. If a relationship with the Holy Spirit is not that important yet, how is such a person going to have the relationship with Christ that they claim to long for? Our relationship with the Holy Spirit is a bridge into knowing Christ as our life. You know, I just, even though we have, I believe, looked at this paragraph and these paragraphs previously, they are so important, and I do believe that many of the things that are coming um, in these next pages kind of link into areas we've been discussing in the past as well. So let's, let's continue to focus on this area. It is paramount, so paramount. Um, and how do we break that down into daily life, into personal? You know, um, there is just... You know, I, I kind of think of it as searching, not introspection, not self-analyzation, not, yes, examining our hearts, but it's not that. But there is this searching for the voice of the Holy Spirit in you. It's like 
you're cultivating a quietness and a sensitivity to his voice from within that he can begin to illuminate, I mean, in the sense of show you, not your brain, but show your heart what was motivating you when you did that. Now that can sound, I don't know, either so simple or so not something we would even consider doing that it's not practical, but that is, to me, one of the most practical, continual, constant relationships, ways of relating, communications between you and the Holy Spirit that you have on the daily. I mean, that's the big daily basis right there. That's, that's to me, until Christ is formed, that's the, this is the big one right here. So let's just say uh, you have a discussion with somebody, and in the midst of that discussion, you were sharing Jesus, you were opening your hearts, you were helping each other, maybe correcting each other in certain ways as friends or whatnot. But the Holy Spirit came to you later and said, you know, when you said that one sentence, that that was mingled with your own personal justification of your flesh. And that released something that wasn't Christ that caused them to pull back a little bit because they could feel that. And, it, and then when you corrected them, there was a part of that that was mingled in with anger or malice. Um, and then there was a slight, you know, and, and there's just no way to allow the Spirit of God to divide that out in you without having super sensitivity to him. And you have to, you have to develop that. Now, part of the trick with that and part of the thing that I think the Lord's been emphasizing over and over again in this class is it's, it's never going to come by looking at the other person. Um, only God knows if his servant falls or stands. You know, once we begin to try to create a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit so that he can tell us what's wrong with Brother Billy and Sister Susie, he, he's not in the business of um, what would happen if he shared it with us of, um, you know, accusing the brethren. Because, you know, that's basically how we would take it. In that, if, you know, unless we're a leader who's there to cover and he's giving us for that specific purpose, why, do, why, would, why would he tell us that? You know, I mean, he's concerned about Christ being formed in me, in you, in the person that he's in. His emphasis is not going to be to point out their faults. If I could say it this way, to point out your faults, because you're the one Christ wants to be formed in. And um, many times, he won't tell you if, if Sister Susie or Brother Billy is doing it by the Spirit of Christ, is doing it with hidden motives, is doing it purely, or is doing it selfishly, because all of that shouldn't negate Christ in us. Knowing their motivation should have absolutely no bearing on how much Jesus lives in us or doesn't live in us. So usually us asking him for information about other people is because we're going to try to justify our reactions instead of let Christ be formed in us. So really, the Holy Spirit, I know if I asked him what's going on in Sister Susie, he'd go, excuse me, but why, why, what motivated you to ask me what was going on in them? And I go, I, I don't know, that's why you're in me. And he'd say, okay, good, that's a good answer. Let me tell you, you want to justify the flesh that you've asked me to crucify that Christ might be formed in. You want that to keep living, and you want to justify what God crucified and condemned in his son to keep living because Brother Bobby or Sister Susie isn't 100% conformed to Jesus yet. Maybe. So let's go on and ask each other, should we continue with this discussion about Brother Bobby and Sister Susie? Or it's not, Lindsay said, it's not going well. <laughs> no, it's not going well at all. And maybe the Holy Spirit is beginning to get grieved. You know, you can see his big white wings just full of helping you and showing you the way, and all of a sudden they're starting to fold in. And we're like, uh, I don't feel comfortable with you anymore. <laughs> this is not my ministry, you know, and before long, it's like, where'd he go? I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm not finding, and I'm not hearing his voice. Well, we don't want to grieve him, and that, you know, but we can grieve the Lord. The Song of Solomon talks about the Lord removing his presence, his manifest presence, or hiding himself to draw her out. Well, I believe that's the heart of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, 
that at times when we grieve them, whatever person of the Godhead and all three in one that might be, they will withdraw based on their nature. But, but their heart, God's heart, is that we would be, because we are lovers of God, the bride of, the wife of the Lamb, the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we would be, we would be grieved that we grieve them. You know, that, that would, tr because it's a love relationship, that would trigger something in us that would go, what did I do? What, what did I do? You know, because usually that's our reaction the first time it happens. What, what, I, what the heck? <laughs> I didn't. But that's because we're so unconformed. We have no clue yet about who he is, and he's not yet formed within us, even though we're joined. We're in Christ. We're, we're one. We're his flesh. We're his bones. It's, it's settled, but it hasn't manifested. It hasn't formed in us yet. Christ hasn't formed in us that relationship of oneness, his life in us. So we're just kind of like befuddled, like, what? Is he just hypersensitive? Goodness. And, and the answer is, no, you just majorly violated his person <laughs> when you did that. And that made him withdraw. And that was meant to clue you into the fact that you don't know him and that that action or reaction was not after his kind or his spirit, not one with his heart and nature, not his life in you. And that should cause you to cry out to the person of the Holy Spirit to show you what, what the heck did I just do? But that will never be the response of someone who just loves to justify themselves. I mean, how easy is it for humans to curse God and justify themselves and live that way till they die? I am sure all of us know people who have spent the majority of their life blaming God for some tragic event in their life, never ever pressing past their understanding of the situation and dying with a with a ought in their heart against God, unforgiveness, accusation. Never ever pressing past their understanding of what happened to find God's view and then to find and then to join with him as a bride. You know, that, that requires us. God is the same. He is not partial. He causes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust. His son died for everybody. He is no respecter of persons. He that seeks shall find. So, I mean, that those people who died with a grudge in their heart against God, they're no different than the person who died conformed to the image of Christ, bearing much fruit. They're the same clay. The difference is that someone cultivated a heart that said, not, not that I love you more than other people, that I've got such a great loving heart, but a, a motive within that said, Holy Spirit, tell me about what God was feeling when that happened. And, you know, maybe sometimes we ask the Holy Spirit to to justify God with explanations so that we can choose to love him. Well, maybe the Holy Spirit isn't wanting to, uh, to explain God to people who will only love him if it makes sense to their minds. Maybe he wants to reveal his character and his person so great that with or without explanations, we know him and we love him and we trust him. Even so, if it be good in thy sight, our words Jesus said to his father, even so, father, if it seem good in your sight. No, that came from a oneness. I know you. I know you greater than the explanation. I know you, your heart, your person. If I can't comprehend the way of the cross, the way of my Father, the way of love in this, I know my Father. And I will wait upon his word to me in his time. If, he sh if it so please him to share his heart with me in this and how that manifests in these situations, I, I'm with him, but I will not limit my love because of explanations or lack thereof. Well, all these things tie into that heart that's drawing nigh to the Holy Spirit, that's creating a relationship that can help us enter into union with Christ, see? It never, it never looks this, this way, the, the blame game. It never goes outside of, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of seeing Jesus, of, of Christ being formed in me, of deal with me. Thy servant listens. You know, I am 
brought low before the throne of grace that I might finally be open, that I am not Mr. or Mrs. Wonderful, but I need Jesus. And they say there's no higher place in the universe than at the feet of Jesus where he can pour his life into us. We are we're, we're emptied of ourselves that we might be filled with him, see? And, um, you know, some of that comes from cultivating a relationship with the Holy Spirit where he's can, he can empty you, you know. Uh, you might say, our soul might say to the Holy Spirit, gee, God doesn't really love me very much if he allowed me to go through that or if he's speaking to me this way or if the word of God says that. When, you know, the Holy Spirit might come back and say, well, God doesn't love that person he crucified. He loves you and his son. And he don't love that. He crucified that. He rejected that. He cursed that in his son. That isn't the you that he loves. That's the you he, he killed <laughs> in Christ. Amen. What? That's not very kind. Well, that's not very what, that's not very your kind. That's exactly the kind that God is. Who do you want to be one with? <laughs> the old creation or Christ oh my gosh how could you be so mean and insensitive what you know he's like I'm the spirit of truth not of your fantasy world get with me I'm on your side I'm fighting for you no only people who pet my flesh are fighting for me no those people will pet your flesh straight to hell I'm serious now that's the truth Paul said the more I love y'all the more you hate me <laughs> Yeah, I love these guys who come in here like the prophets of old and tell you peace, peace when there is no peace. And when the guy comes from God's heart to save you by the cross, God's only way of saving anyone, you hate him. It's like, what am I going to do here? Come on now. I'm the one that God's sending to love you. You just don't understand God's kind of love. Well, who's going to help us understand God's kind of love? The Holy Spirit, who is God, who was sent as a spirit of truth to teach us who God is. So we need to listen to him. And, and I really do think, and we had a couple back, maybe three or four classes back, we had time where, where we were talking about how we, um, we shut him down because we secretly are broken on the inside because of the fall where we really believe we know more than even God himself. And that we're all born with that broken thing in us. It's a result of the fall. And um, that the Holy Spirit, we want to identify that thing in us you can call it pride but I'd like to put a more specific name on it and just say that broken thing in us that thinks it knows more than even God himself and humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and say I, I just don't know I think I know I'm broken on the inside so I in my pride think I know but I don't know I don't see I'm naked and I'm hungry and I, I, I'm, I'm needing Christ revealed in me so, Holy Spirit, be my eyes, be my ears. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, heart hath not comprehended what, what the Spirit wants to freely give to those who love him. So, but if we think our heart sees, comprehends, and then we're, we're, we've already chosen the wisdom of the natural man, the, the, the view of the natural man, the, the sense realm as our source, rather than God by the spirit realm. And yeah, if we've chosen that, if we've done it a hundred times, if we're the chiefest among sinners in that area, today is the day of repentance. Harden not your heart. You know, just turn. Turn to the Lord and say, I don't want to live by the sense realm. I don't want to live by justifying my flesh. I want to live in union with the Holy Spirit. And I want to enter into oneness with Christ. And I want to cultivate that by being open to you. And that same spirit will translate when he starts saying, no, no, no. You, you, you only want, that's malice at work in you. That's anger. There is a hidden agenda there to please man. You're just wanting to look. And we'll go, no, I, I we just will take a moment. And say, it's amazing how he does this. Show me, Holy Spirit, show me what's it really at work in there. And he'll start showing you. Not in human words, but in your heart's language. He will begin to reveal what is at work in your motives. And you go, dang. He goes, yeah, that's where Christ 
and the cross and all this deep, heavy spiritual stuff that you preach and read and hear about, that's it right there. Jesus wants to go right into that motive and, and live Christ, <laughs> live himself in you towards that person with his spirit right there. That's what it all looks like in real time. Whoa, yeah, that's a fulfillment, all that stuff you've been teaching, hearing, singing. Whoa, right there, right, right there. Christ wants to appear in you and have the right motive, <laughs> his motive. And you're like, whoa. I mean, the Holy Spirit starts making it real specific, real time. The Holy Spirit isn't like, let me share with you the lovely, lofty doctrine of, you know, angels in the, in the rafters. <laughs> He's like, no, no, no. I want to get into your motivation, into your relations with other people, into how you treat your brother and your sister, how you justify your flesh when crisis comes, how you react when there's too much pressure. And I want to show you what's you, not to condemn you, not to make you feel unloved according to the way humans love, but to father you, to shepherd you, to God you, to bring you into my fullness. This is the path to empty you of you, to fill you with me. And you just start going, I hear your heart. I see where we're going. You're heading straight for Isaac's tent. You're headed straight for the new creation. You're running wildly and passionately to bring me into the fullness of Christ. Only my pride, only my personal view, only my soul's comprehension of love is keeping me from, from running with you and crying out, come, Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha, even so come. You know, you begin to know him instead of knowing cultural Christianity and sociology the way unrenewed, unregenerated, unborn again humans live. You know, you, you, you break off with that creation. You are a new creation. The, my Bible says everything, all things have become new because Jesus has trans, he's crucified the old, put it away, and brought forth a whole new economy, a whole new humanity, a whole new way of existing as a new creation born from above, born out from the Spirit of God of his kind, of his species, of his family. We don't live the way we used to live. We don't love the way we used to love. We don't see things the way. We're of a whole new race. It's that radical. It's that revolutionary. It's that completely other once we're born again into, into God through Christ. And we need, and our whole system, I mean, we think it's radical when we go from vistas, you know, Windows Vista to Windows 7. We're like, Wow. What a change. And then you go from Windows 7 to Windows 8, and it really is a terrible change. <laughs> True. <laughs> but, but we're not talking like the next upgrade on the operating system of Windows here. We're talking like a whole new species. It's not even a computer. <laughs> it's a spiritual being that has nothing to do with computer world, man, material world cyber optics, this and that, electron. It's so other, you can't even compare the two. They're not even apples and oranges. They're not even the same vegetable kingdom. They're just totally other. So quit trying to run your computer on Windows 7 because you're not even a computer anymore. You're a spirit being. You don't even understand who you are yet. So quit trying to superimpose Windows 7 on what you have become in Christ. Because the two don't operate together. They don't work. The, that which is spirit is spirit, and that which is flesh is flesh, and there you have it. Jesus says, I, there, I'm not going to mingle. Ooh, let's just take a little bit of Bill Gates' wisdom and put it on in. There's, there, the two are totally incompatible. The flesh and the spirit, no, they war. They do not come together in oneness. No wire from that operating system is going to fit and plug into this one. Nada, nothing. What do you do? You get real humble and you say, I haven't got a clue how this new operating system works, even though I'm of it, even though I'm in it, even though I'm after its kind. All I know is the old way. That's, the old, that's how I was wired. I need my mind renewed. I need to be transformed in the spirit of my mind. I need to be metamorphosized in my being. I need Christ formed in me. Who's going to help me make the leap? The person of the Holy Spirit. Well, if he comes to you with his, you know, all these great things about how this new creation works and 
what the reality is. Come with gifts, burgeoning with the spirit of the new to bring you into it, to let you taste of it, to, to teach you and bring you in line upon line, you know, just every, ever, ever more so. And you go, what is this? This is foolishness. This is insanity. I don't even know what world you're coming from. Yeah, and he goes, I know you don't. It's very obvious to me. I know what world I'm coming from. It's called Christ, the risen son. What? I don't get it. It doesn't. At that point, there comes the time where you have to say, I don't know. I don't know, but you do. Open my eyes. Breathe the spirit of this into me. Bring, bring the life of it into me. Form Christ in. Form this operating system in me. Wire me according to the way this system works. And all that is is Christ, Christ's mind. How does his wiring, how is Jesus wired? How's the Lamb of God wired? Start wiring me in that mind. Start my motives, my inward parts. Start making the inward parts of my computer function according to the operating system of Christ crucified. Rewire me, rewrite my hardware, rewrite my software, rewrite every part of me according to the spirit and nature and way of Christ in me so that I am totally transformed. I operate in a whole new way, and it is Christ in me. And it's not some ethereal thing that I don't understand. I know his mind. I see how he works. I comprehend how this functions because I'm one with it. In the power of the Holy Spirit, I have have entered in to the new, and Christ is formed in me. Man, if you just throw the sense realm at every time he tries to share Christ with you, you throw the sense realm back in the Holy Spirit's face. You throw the old ways of how humans function. You throw human wisdom. You justify your flesh. You give them the way humans love. You give them the way humans correct. You give them the way the church world does stuff. He's just going to go, come on now, guy. You're, you're starting to really grieve me here. I'll come back when you're ready to learn. How about that? Yikes. Now that is scary. You don't want to convince the Holy Spirit that you're just not open to knowing Christ as your life. And we can do it without even realizing we're doing it. And you say, well, Kelly, you're scaring me. Well, good. Get really, really scared. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Get so scared that you start watching your reactions to the Holy Spirit, that you start seeing how you really treat him, that you repent, and you start following him and listening to him a little more. Fear is a good thing in the Lord. <laughs> it's a great teach. Man, it gets your attention. <laughs> I... I Fear has always meant something tormenting and evil to me. You know why? That's because your definition of fear comes from the old creation. It's exactly what we've been talking about. You need to get the new creation definition of the fear of the Lord. You need to get the new creation definition of love. Quit throwing in my face and in the Holy Spirit's face all your justifications from the old creation because they don't hold water here. They may hold water in your heart, and when the devil comes to have a tea party with you over that, you two can really get along well. You have great communion. And if you can find a brother or sister who's just young enough and dumb enough in the Lord to agree with you because they still live by the old, then you can feel justified and you can contaminate someone else. But you ain't going to move me and you ain't going to move the Lord. Well, that's not very fun. No, it gets really sad when you start reaping that harvest. Well, you're, you're making me afraid again. Well, go get afraid. The Lord's trying to bring you in, save your life from this. Is that so evil that he doesn't just let you, you know, Die in your own muck? He's, he's pulling you home. He's drawing you in. It, it's not like the movies where there's this glamour music and he comes on a white horse and it's just this fantasy Jesus. And he's working in real time with real people, fighting the good fight to bring him in. God loves you and he'll lay his life down to get you in, despite all your criticism and blame at him. He will stay true to himself and he will stay true to you and he will stay true to the cross. And if you hate him for it, he can't deny who he is. He will just continue to wait and lay down his life and send his prophets, if you will, send his word. It's just the same thing that we read about in the Old Testament. They kept rejecting me, but I kept sending my prophet. They kept rejecting me, but I kept sending my word. They kept rejecting me and accepting the way of all the Canaanites around them and all the Baal worshipers around them and all the ways of getting increase and worshiping God and you know, nothing having to do with us dying to self, nothing having to do with the cross, nothing having to do with the way of a corn of wheat in the ground. 
everything to do with making us feel okay, justifying flesh. And he said, hey, come on now. If you ask the Holy Spirit who's right here, he'll tell you the way of the cross. He'll take you to the scriptures and prove it to you. He'll bear witness in your inner man that's regenerated by God. This is true. God has not left us defenseless. Little children, you know the Lord. You have the anointing in you. Well, sharing like this is eventually going to probably get me shot one, one day, <laughs> but I don't care. Because I'm not going to not be true to Jesus if everybody hates me and thinks I'm just mean. And I'll sit before the Holy Spirit and let him pick apart what motives weren't Christ in me. And I'll get on my face and repent and then I'll cry to you, which I do regularly, <laughs> as we all know. <laughs> but I can't not be true to Jesus and to you, no matter how it makes me look. Sometimes it makes me look really nice. Like, wow, everybody just really loves Kelly right now. She just seems so sweet in Jesus. There's other times just like, she, I think Kelly's just getting a little too strong on that cross stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? It ain't about people liking me or not liking me. It's about Jesus. It's about his cross. It's about the mission of the Holy Spirit to bring us as a bride prepared for Isaac, prepared for the lamb, after his same kind, speaking his same language, wired the way he's wired, ready to be with him in his kingdom, to be his kingdom. You know, we talked about Esther, but there is another woman in that book. We talked about Esther and Haggai a couple weeks back. There's another woman in that book. Who knows her name? Starts with a V. Vashti. Good old Vashti, yeah. Good old Vashti. <laughs> remember Lot's wife? Remember Vashti. <laughs> Two good old girls. Just kind of went their own way. It didn't work out for them very well. It's good at Really good. That mean old God did it again. Boy, I'm going to get him for that. How could a God of love allow that? I don't know. Maybe you should ask the Holy Spirit. But Vashti, you know, thought that this kingdom and this being the bride of the king and this glory and all this was just because, you know, hey, I'm Vashti. I got the right name. I got the right dresses. I got all the maidens that helped me get dressed every morning. And when I walk around and parade myself with the name of king's wife, I look pretty hot. And, uh, you know, Vashti's big problem was she did not respect her husband, the king. And she inspired all the women in the kingdom to not have to respect their husbands. Hmm. You think that could be happening in the church world at all? Towards the Lamb of God, the groom of the church? Just a thought. She inspired women, inspired them, influenced them by example to not have to respect her husband, the king. And the Lord and all of the Lord's men and all the wise men, all the counselors said, you've got to get that woman out of there. She is not after this kingdom. She is not after this kind, and she is tearing down the kingdom. That's not bride. That's not wife. That's not queen. That is anti-kingdom, anti-wife, and anti-queen. we got to find one who has his heart, his spirit. we got to find one who will listen to Haggai, who will allow Haggai to bring the spirit of the king and not always push her own way. No, no, I don't have to submit to that. I know how to do things. I know how I see things. I know how I want things run. I know what I feel about this. Haggai, go away. There's, I have no time for that bath in the myrrh. I have got my own fragrance, my own apothecary, and my own way of doing things, and my own sweetness. I have no time for this. Yeah, you're not going to have time for a lot because you're not. You're going to have time for a lot because you're not going to have anything to do, but twiddle your thumbs because the kingdom is taken from you. The kingdom never belonged to that. It belonged to the bride, the wife of the lamb. That's what the Holy Spirit's trying to say. Hey, where's somebody who's open enough to let me? Wash them with his mind to let me apply the way he feels. Pour in his spirit. Form his heart. Soak them in the real spirit of the king so they can be after his kind and part of this kingdom, representing this kingdom, this self-sacrificing nation. What was the deciding point for Esther? It wasn't just that she let Haggai prepare her for six months and then another six. It was then when it came time, and is this not like our Jesus? Is this not like our Father? It is so like our Father. Oh my God. 
oh my God, my God, that is my God. That he would say, are you really his wife, the lamb's wife? Then will you lay your life down for your people, the Jews, that are just about all to get killed based on Haman's schemes, the schemes of the flesh? She proved that she was the real thing when she said, if I perish, I perish, but I put others first. Well, that's it. She got the spirit of the lamb the wife of the lamb. Now that's proof that the Holy Spirit truly did have his way in her because she conformed to the image of the lamb. And she had the spirit of the kingdom. Why would would we talk about that now? Because of this, everybody, Kelly first. We can't fake this relationship with the Holy Spirit. If we really honor him, if we really submit to him, if we really enter into his dealings and allow him to search our heart and allow him to reveal Christ, not justify flesh, not have a know-it-all attitude, not point the finger at others, but open ourselves to him and let him bring forth his kingdom, this son in us, then the proof will be in the pudding the day the crisis comes and we have to choose I live or they live. And if it has been really the work of the Spirit bringing forth Christ in you, Christ in you will take over you. You'll have to yield, but he will be there in his power and life to say, I am going to the cross for them. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And this, this isn't a false cross. This isn't religion. This isn't asceticism. This is Christ crucified in you, Esther. And he is releasing that sweet savor to the Father, and he is going into death for those people. Oh, that woman really was. You can't fake this relationship because if you do, the day you're tested, you will live and they will perish. God will test you. He'll taste to see if it's Christ in you. Why am I saying this? I I really don't know. I had no plan for today's class, so I'm just talking. But the thought comes to me that the Lord is trying to to say to us, you can't fake this. And that it's so serious that at the end of the day, when it's time that the body of Christ needs you, they need someone who will be led to the altar and sacrifice themselves in the nature of the lamb. They need a seed that will fall on the ground and die. They need someone who's so conformed to the image of Christ that they'll let death work in them, that they will bear his dying in in their mortal flesh. That when that hour comes, for such a time as this, isn't that what Esther said? For such a time as this, when that such a time comes to you, if you have not truly cultivated a relationship with the Holy Spirit, wherein he could bring forth Christ in this way, they will perish and you will live. Whether that be a nation or just some person in the church or your husband or your wife or your child or somebody that you're meant to look out for at work, self will reign and self always survives. It's one of the strongest impulses and animal instincts in humans, if you will, is the survival instinct. We will fight to live, even if it means stepping on someone else. That's what we are apart from Christ. But Christ in us, once he's been formed in the power of the Holy Spirit, he will go where we will not go, and he will do it in us, just like Jesus said to Peter right before Jesus ascended up to the Father. He said, Peter, when you were young, you went wherever you wanted to go. But the day is coming when you will be girded up, and another will take you where you would not go. Another will take you. And he was speaking of the cross at work in him, of Christ being formed in him of the power of another life overcoming Peter, even Peter's zeal, even Peter's zeal that made him still deny Christ three times when it came to saving his own life. And he said, you tried, and you still went the way of self-preservation, Peter. But there is coming a time when another's going to gird you up and carry you where you wouldn't go, straight to the altar, straight to the place where you won't deny me, but you will be a partaker of my sufferings. You will release my spirit. You will partake in my crucified life. Peter was a hothead. Peter was a justifier. Peter was the zealot. Peter was Peter. Peter was Kelly. Peter was all of what we are in our own zeal and passion and uncrucified desire to serve God. 
But God got Peter. God so worked, God, the person of the Holy Spirit, so worked in Peter that at the end of the day, he could prove Peter, and Peter's zeal wasn't what came up to the surface. The nature of the lamb came up, and he went into death. However many years earlier when Christ was crucified and Peter denied him three times, what came to the surface was Peter. Peter saying, I love God. Peter saying, I'll do his will. But Peter can't love God and do his will until Christ be formed in him. So that test, Peter failed because it was still Peter. But after a long time of relating to the Holy Spirit and Christ being formed in him and the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ being revealed in the word and being revealed in Peter, another test came to prove it. Many tests came. And Peter had decreased in Christ had increased, and Peter went to the altar. And so did all the other apostles of the Lamb, upon whose foundation the new Jerusalem is built. Martyrs, true witnesses. What does the Holy Spirit make you? A true witness of Christ. What does witness mean? A martyr. Not someone who talks about Christ crucified and lives their, their own life. Not someone who prays deep Christ crucified prayers and then goes out and lives for self in secret inner chambers like the house in Ezekiel that was full of those inner chambers of the temple, full of defiling things. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit goes into the temple of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he, he removes all that idolatry. He removes all that false worship. He makes it a habitation for the Son. He prepares the way for his coming. Like John the Baptist prepares the way like Malachi speaks of at the end of the, his prophecy, prepares the way for the Lord to come and inhabit his temple, us, his, his body. He's preparing the Holy Spirit, he's preparing the way for the Son to have habitation in our motives, in our inward parts, not just in our deeds. See, we owe, we're so that creation minded that we go, oh, yeah, when, when Jesus comes, it's going to be, I'm going to do, I'm going to give money to the poor and I'm going to be a good helper at the outreach and I'm going to do my chores at the Bible school and I'm going to tithe on Sundays and I'm going to be a, a, a Bible club leader in a cell group or something. I don't know. He's like, no, no, no. The Holy Spirit's going to make whatever you do, stand in line at the grocery store, have on the inside the nature of Christ. Others first. No, not, 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 not the doing of others first. The eternal spirit of the Lamb who by nature, by essence, by life, another life, puts others first in the love of God. The spirit of true sacrifice. God, God himself. Not a temple full of false doves and false lambs that Jesus had to drive out. The real thing. The real thing. The one that God receives when it's offered up. The one that people know, this is giving life. This is Christ in that person. Man, that's a real thing. That wasn't just them. They would never have done that. Peter would never have done that. Lindsay would never have done that. Kelly would never have done that. That was Christ in them. It's changing my life. I believe in God now. Life is coming into me because there's a dying of Christ that's going on in them. And I know it's true. I feel the results of it. You see? The living, the real, the dying the lamb, the Jesus that God gave us, the spirit reveals in us, and the bride is full of. That's what we're after. And all these little snares along the way that begin in how we relate to the Holy Spirit are really huge things defining how our journey is going to go. Can you kind of see that? Can you kind of see how that's going to affect the end? These beginning decisions of how we relate to the Holy Spirit is going to affect the end of where we end up, in whose image we are. Like in Matthew 24, 25, I forget which chapter, God says, lamb or goat, lamb or goat. He's not judging on who shared Christ the most, who did the most ministry deeds. He's saying, who's conformed to his image? The lambs, they go to the altar like Esther did. But the goats, they may speak great things and prophesy and cast out demons, but I don't know them. They're not after my kind. My kind is lamb, not goat. They don't have my spirit. They put self first. The goats put others, the lambs put others first to their own sacrifice. Well, God's looking at the end of the day at who have you conformed to? The Holy Spirit's working today to make sure that it's the lamb and not a goat. Amen? And it's the goat in us that kicks back at the spirit. 
And it's the lamb in us that joins with him and cries out, come, Lord Jesus, come. So may we cultivate that relationship in these daily motives, in the ways that we receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for, you know, warning us, speaking clearly to us, helping the word of God become more than a story or a teaching, but a word of exhortation for today so that we might heed the cries of your spirit through your word that is spirit and life. And we might listen and receive, flow with you, and not hinder the Holy Spirit in his eternal ministry, but hasten him on his journey to Isaac's tent with a bride. Lord, we just bless you. We love you, and we thank you so much for feeling the freedom to speak your heart with us. Speak for your servants, listen. We love you, and we want you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. It's going to go on. Why don't y'all just take a few minutes with the Lord? Because